Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the third of our series of investigations or webinars looking at concrete overlays. Uh, this is part of an ongoing series run by the CP Tech Center in collaboration with the American Concrete Paving Association. The topic today is looking at design of concrete overlays. For those who don't know, the CP Tech Center is a university center with a focus on trying to get good technology in the hands of practitioners, both from agencies and from industries. And part of our work is uh, sponsored by the Portland Cement Association, the Iowa Concrete Paving Association, Iowa DOT, and the American Concrete Paving Association and their uh, various chapter states. So we, we have to s uh, express some thanks to all of these organizations for helping us to be able to support this activity that we're running with. Our speakers today are Eric Firibri from the American Concrete Paving Association and Angela Folkstad from Colorado chapter of the ACPA. And so uh, Eric will be telling us the science and technology behind design and Angela's going to be telling us some stories about how they've applied it and how successful it has been in Colorado. We do uh, encourage people to uh, write questions and they can be written into the uh, question box and they will be addressed later in the week back to everybody who is logged on to the system. Uh, this is, as I said, this is part of uh, a five part series on overlays. Uh, the following ones will include plans and maintenance of traffic and then maintenance and uh, repairs and other resources available to you. Also, as part of uh, today's session, we do have to provide some learning objectives and these are up on the screen. And with that, I will close it out and hand it back over to Eric. Take it away. All right, there we go. So today we're talking about concrete overlay design and the design functions and thickness as well. And so to give you guys a little overview of what we're going through, we're gonna start off with kind of a brief overview of what we talked in the last session about pavement evaluation because our pavement design process really starts there. Then we'll go through determining the overlay type, the design lane, uh, life and traffic, and then we'll actually get into the pavement design software. And a lot of times, when I hear overlay design, the first thing that I think about is thickness design and using pavement design tools to do that. So that's where we're going to spend a bulk of our time today. And then we're going to go through um, some additional design features and then construction process and construction documents to close it out before we hand things over to Angela. So starting off with pavement evaluation. The pavement evaluation is really a critical part of the pavement design process because we need to understand what the existing pavement is to be able to determine what kind of design approach we're going to take in designing our new concrete overlay. So by doing a pavement evaluation, we, have, we can determine if we're in good or fair condition and we can do maybe a thinner bonded type overlay or if we're in poor deteriorated condition where we may need a thicker unbonded overlay and we can treat that existing structure more as a base rather than uh, utilizing it in the existing, utilizing it as a structural layer in our new concrete overlay. And so we go through here and we kind of look at what, uh, what we're doing with, uh, with our pavement, whether we're in good or excellent condition, we may be looking at maintenance. These resurfacing options that we're talking about with these overlays are more in, uh, in that realm of good to fair to poor, or even some cases down to deteriorated condition. So in addition to getting information just on our structural layer and what we're placing the paper, our new overlay on, we can get a lot of information from an evaluation and a survey. And so you can see some of, the, some of that information here, but we can really determine what existing pavement is there beyond just that surface layer, but what are the other layers in there? What are their properties? We can also determine what's happened to it before. Have we done some widenings? Have we um, utilized some different material? And uh, also have, has that existing pavement seen some rehabilitation already or some um, patching? And what condition those are in? And do we need to do more of it? 
Do we need to get that pavement in a little better condition before we actually place an overlay on top of it? So we can get a lot of, we can gather a lot of information on our existing pavement that's going to help us when we get, actually start designing our concrete overlay. Additionally, we can determine if there's an issue that can't be solved by a concrete overlay that needs to be addressed before we do anything else with an overlay. So we can gather a lot of good information here doing that pavement evaluation survey. So um, that's a great place to start in our concrete overlay design process. So now that we've, did, uh, we've gone through the pavement evaluation, that was a brief one minute overview. If you want more information, please, or please feel free to go back and watch that uh, second webinar in our series. Um, but now we can move on to determining the overlay type and looking at the design life and the traffic. So the overlay type selection really starts with what is our existing pavement? Do we have an asphalt or composite pavement or do we have a full depth concrete pavement? What are we placing this new concrete overlay on? And the next step of that really hinges on the pavement evaluation. What is the condition of that existing pavement? So let's start off with our, let's start off with asphalt and composite pavements. So we know we have an asphalt pavement uh, or a composite, doesn't really matter, asphalt or composite. And we need to know that uh, the, um, what performance level it's kind of at. Is it in good or uh, good or fair condition or is it down in the poor or deteriorated condition? That's gonna kind of determine how much we can rely on that existing structure to help out with, uh, to help our overlay carry the load. So if we're in a situation where we have a, an existing asphalt that's in poor to deteriorated condition, we likely don't wanna rely so much on that existing structure to help carry the load. We're probably gonna treat it more as a strong base. And so we're likely gonna do an unbonded concrete overlay of asphalt or UCOA. So these can be designed for and it, for significant truck traffic, and depending on the truck traffic that we're designing for, they're gonna be somewhere in the realm of four to 11 inches. So it can be a fairly thick concrete overlay to help carry all of that load. So now if we have an asphalt or composite pavement that's in good to fair condition, then we may be able to utilize that structure to help carry the load directly with the concrete overlay. So the concrete and the asphalt can work together to help carry the load. So that could be uh, getting the best of both worlds. So in this case, we would be doing a bonded concrete overlay uh, of asphalt or BCOA. So these overlays, the benefit of this is that our concrete overlay tends to be a little bit thinner. And a lot of times we'll see shorter joint spacings used in this scenario to help reduce the stresses in our concrete layer as well as the, the asphalt below. So by doing that, we can control the loading on our uh, concrete overlay and we can thin up the section. <clears throat> so the next type of overlay, we're gonna skip over to our bonded concrete overlay of concrete. And so for bonded concrete overlays on concrete pavements, the existing concrete pavement really needs to be in good or excellent condition. And so a scenario that we may wanna do this type of overlay on is if we've built a, we've recently built a concrete pavement, it's in good condition, but say, they determine that they're going to build a distribution center that's heavily going to utilize that existing pavement. You may want to consider a concrete overlay to help carry that additional load. That's, uh, that, would be a determined, that would be one factor that you may want to use a bonded concrete overlay on concrete. So the existing concrete really needs to be in good condition to be able to do this type of uh, concrete overlay. And it's really for adding extra capacity to an existing design. So now our last type of overlay is an unbonded concrete overlay of concrete. And so these are for more deteriorated conditions of concrete pavements. We have a concrete pavement, it's at the end of its design life. Option to, uh, one option to utilize that existing structure is that unbonded concrete overlay of concrete. And here, that existing concrete is really now just going to be a strong base for us to build on. It's a really stiff, good structure to build a new concrete pavement on. So we do this unbonded concrete overlay on concrete. You can see it's gonna be somewhere, anywhere from four to 11 inches, and it can carry significant traffic on that new structure. Now, one extra thing that we need to think about with an unbonded concrete overlay on concrete is what are we using to make sure that the concrete, uh, the new overlay does not bond to the existing concrete. And so there are two bond breakers that we can use, non-woven geotextile fabrics and asphalt interlayers. Um, these non-woven geotextile fabrics have 
uh, kind of ca caught on quite a bit. And so there's a lot of good information from the CP Tech Center on these. They've got map briefs as well as some recommendations on what's to be used. And then ACPA also has a guide specification on actually um, rolling out and using these uh, non-woven geotextiles as well. So good resources are available if um, we're looking at these different types of um, inner layers. So the next step in the design process is getting some preliminary information. And this is kind of where we determine what are, what are we really hoping to get out of this new structure? Are we looking for some significant life, 30, 40 plus years, or are we looking for stop gaps somewhere in the 10 to 20 year range? We can really design for any type of design life that we want. Um, it's just a determination of what we want to design for. Now it's important to note here that when we're considering a design life, if you want, or if you're looking just to get 10 years out of pavement, you may want to consider what does an extra half inch of concrete get me? Because um, it could be a fairly significant amount of extra life out of just a half an inch of material that wouldn't add additional cost. So determining a design life, this is really a starting point. Really encourage you as you go through the design process to start considering, you know, what minor changes can we make to get significant extra life out of our pavement. So the next information that we need is that uh, information that we got from our pavement evaluation, but also we need some traffic information as well. What kind of truck traffic is this uh, pavement being subjected to and what is it projected to be expect or projected to carry uh, going out those 20, 30, whatever our design life years are. And so once we know that, that's gonna really help us through the design process, knowing what kind of truck traffic we have. Alrighty, so that brings us to the fun stuff, our use of the pavement design softwares that are out there to design concrete overlays. So the four main design tools that are the primary, primary ways to design concrete overlays in the US are the four that we can see here. We've got Astro 93, we've got AstroWare's Pavement ME tool, Pavement Designer, and the BCOA ME, or Bonded Concrete Overlay of Asphalt Mechanistic Empirical. So we're gonna go through each of these four. Now that's not to say there aren't other design tools. There are some other design tools um, that we're not gonna cover here. A few of them are uh, covered in the CP Tech Center Guide to Concrete Overlays. Um, so you can look there for a little more information on some of those other ones. But these are the four primary ones that we're gonna talk about today and the, mo the most common ones to be used. So let's start with the oldest one that's out there and that's Ashto 93. So if you've ever used the Ashto 90, or if you've ever, ever used Ashto 93 to design a pavement, not just an overlay, but just a general concrete pavement, you've likely seen this design equation before. This is the Ashto 93 design equation for jointed plane concrete pavements. You can see it's fairly basic. We've got about 11 inputs that we, that we can play around with, and realistically, it's more like five or six that we can actually um, utilize as designers. So that's what we're really focused on with this Ashto 93 design equation. Now, the Ashto 93 design guide, when we're looking at overlays, utilizes this design equation with some modifications, which we'll see in just a second. But it utilizes this equation for designing unbonded concrete overlays of asphalt, unbonded concrete overlays on concrete, and then bonded concrete overlays on concrete as well. But all of these utilize this design equation for uh, which is originally meant for full depth jointed plain concrete pavements. Okay, so those modifications that it makes to that, uh, that design equation are these. So if we're doing an unbonded concrete overlay of asphalt, it really just treats that asphalt as a stiff sub-base layer. So it gets incorporated into the K value or the support underneath the concrete layer. So that's how it does unbonded concrete overlays of asphalt. For unbonded concrete overlays on concrete and bonded concrete overlays of concrete, it really takes and it, uh, it, you utilize that design equation to determine the required thickness of a new concrete pavement. And then you get a little credit back for the existing concrete section that you have. And that's that effective concrete thickness that's um, in, the, in both of those design equations. The required concrete thickness is the one that you would solve for as a new full depth jointed plain concrete pavement. And then the um, other, the final thickness, the thickness that we're actually solving for is the overlay thickness. And so these adjustments to that design equation were actually originally developed by the Corps of Engineers um, to design for concrete overlays. Now, 
those adjustments are applied to that existing ASHO 93 design equation for full depth jointed plank concrete pavements. So it's important to note some of the drawbacks of utilizing that equation. The biggest problem with that is that ASHO 93 is, origin is wholly empirical and it's based on the ASHO road test. The ASHO road test was originally performed between 19 1958 and 1960. And so as you can imagine, it being a two-year road test, it had a fairly limited inference space. We had two years of traffic data, we had two years of climate data um, and climate um, actually degrading our pavement. But we also had a very limited inference space on the number of sections that we had, the amount of uh, the variety of materials that were used, as well as the soils that were used, because all of this was done in central Illinois. And so we have fairly limited inference space. And now that causes some problems with getting realistic designs for concrete pavements. You can see at the bottom left-hand corner, um, at the end of the ASHO road test, we'd only failed about 30% of our concrete sections. 70% of them remained in good condition. And so when they built that ASHO 93 design equation, it's still based on that information. We didn't get a full performance characteristic of how concrete pavements degrade over time. And what we've found over the years is that the ASHO 93 design approach tends to be a little overly conservative when it comes to designing for concrete pavements. So the last thing that I'm going to mention about this is that ASHO 93 and these overlay designs, the failure mechanism is serviceability or present serviceability index. So it's not really capturing cracking or faulting. It's kind of this grouped uh, serviceability that we're designing for. <clears throat> so that brings us to pavement designer. So Pavement Designer is a free tool developed by the concrete pavement industry, and it's developed to be a, a, a mechanistic empirical solution so that um, designers have access to uh, kind of a more robust design process than ASHTO 93 and have free access to that tool. Now, this is primarily developed for cities, counties, streets and local roads, parking and industrial facilities. We're not really, it's not really looked to be for departments of transportation because they have those ASHTO tools, ASHTO 93 and ASHTO Wears Pavement ME, but it is, um, but this is an option for designing these overlays in a mechanistic empirical way. Now, Pavement Designer utilizes Pavement Designer's method for jointed plain concrete pavements, so it's designing like a conventional jointed plain concrete pavement, and then it uses those similar modifications that ASHTO 93 used to it, its equation to determine the overlay thicknesses. So similar to ASHTO 93, we can uh, design for unbonded concrete overlays of asphalt, unbonded concrete overlays of concrete, and bonded concrete overlays of concrete. Now, some of the benefits of using Pavement Designer beyond that it's a free tool that's out there and you can access via the web is that we can actually design with macro synthetic uh, uh, fibers. So we can actually put fibers in these concrete overlays. And this is one place where we've seen a lot of fibers being used because we're designing these thinner concrete overlays. It tends to help performance a little bit and keep things in place a little bit as well. Additionally, Pavement Designer provides joint spacing as an output to the design. Joint spacing is one of those big things with concrete overlays is we have these thinner slabs. We tend to um, like to control the joint spacing a little bit more to determine or to help reduce the stresses in our slabs. Now, finally, the failure mechanisms in, uh, in Pavement Designer are cracking and erosion. So we've moved away from serviceability and more towards how pavements actually fail, that cracking and erosion or faulting uh, that we actually see and consider as uh, designers of pavements. So as I mentioned, those same uh, adjustments to um, Pavement designers jointed plain concrete pavement design are utilized to get the unbond or to get the concrete overlay design thicknesses. So pavement designer does in the background, it calculates the jointed plain concrete pavement design and then applies these adjustments the same way ASHTO 93 would. It's just ASHTO 93 applies them to um, ASHTO 93's design equation. Pavement designer applies them to pavement designer's design equation. So a little background on that. So that leads us to our next tool, the BCOA ME. So as you can imagine in there, that BCOA stands for Bonded Concrete Overlay of Asphalt Mechanistic Empirical. And so this tool is wholly focused on bonded concrete overlays of asphalt. And this is another free tool. It uh, was developed at the University of Pittsburgh under an FHWA pooled fund. It's really a great tool for designing concrete overlays of asphalt and looking at that benefit of bonding uh, with that asphalt pavement. 
Now, BCOAME has a lot of great uh, information and resources uh, that get into the development of that and how it considers that bonding scenario between the concrete and the asphalt. And so there's good information on uh, their website as well. So the BCOAME is really the first tool that we've talked about that really incorporates climatic loading in a robust way. So you can uh, select different cities and it really kind of changes how the overlay is going to perform, which is great because we know that pavements are gonna perform differently in different climates. Additionally, this is the first tool where you can actually uh, put in joint spacing as a featured input. So you can control what the joint spacing is going to be, and that will significantly change what the thickness of the concrete overlay is going to be. Again, if we have shorter joint spacings, we tend to reduce the stresses in our slab. And when we do that, um, we can uh, a lot of times thin up the section of concrete overlay that's required to carry all of the load. Additionally, similar to Pavement Designer, this allows for uh, designing with macrofibers directly in the tool, which is another great thing. So this is a great uh, example of how um, joint spacing can kind of change how these overlays are actually performing. So if we have really short joint spacings, if we're looking at four foot by four foot panels, we see, tend to see the failure mechanism be corner breaks of those concrete, uh, concrete panels. If we have intermediate size or six foot by six foot panels uh, or thereabout, we tend to see the failure mechanism be longitudinal or diagonal cracks. And finally, if we get up to our more conventional uh, size panels where they're full lane widths wide, and then somewhere around 12 to 15 feet uh, long, you can see that we have more transverse cracks. And so it gets a little more complicated uh, actually in the software, but these tend to be the driving, uh, driving failure criteria for the BCOAME. And so now it's important to think with these different joint spacings, as much as possible, we wanna make sure that we're not driving our truck traffic right on those joint lines. Uh, our best case scenario is when we're off the joints of those longitudinal joints a little bit. And so that may be another consideration uh, when we're designing these bonded concrete overlays with these shorter joint spacings. Now, uh, one thing that I also wanna mention is that the University of Pittsburgh is actually working on another tool similar to the BCOAME, and that's going to be focused on unbonded concrete overlays on concrete. So this is a new design tool that's coming out very soon, um, and it's another FHWA pooled fund um, looking to develop this uh, design, this overlay design process. Um, it should be out soon. Just wanna mention that. So that brings us to our last tool that we're gonna talk about, and that is AstroWare's Pavement ME. Now this has gone through a few uh, name changes over the years. So if you hear MEPDG or Mechanistic Empirical Pavement Design Guide, we're still referring to the same tool. The current version is AstroWare Pavement ME and it's version 2.5.5. And so if you hear all those different names, don't be confused, Pavement ME is, its, is what it's currently called. Now, Pavement ME is, a, uh, is not a free tool. It, you have to buy a license and the license is a yearly based subscription. It's fairly expensive, but it is really the most robust tool for designing and analyzing any type of pavement, not just concrete or asphalt or overlays. It really just does just about everything. So you can see here, it's the first tool that we have that designs all types of overlays. We have unbonded concrete on asphalt, bonded on asphalt, which they call SJPCP, or short jointed plain concrete pavement. Um, it can also do unbonded concrete overlays on concrete and bonded concrete overlays on concrete. So we can really design everything. Now Pavement ME incorporates climate data as well, and it's probably the most robust tool to do that too. And it does that through, and it does that and kind of ca is calibrated to performance sections all across the country utilizing long-term pavement performance sections. So it's really a robust tool that looks at just about everything within uh, a pavement and it tries to give the users all of those features and control over those features to see how they impact pavement performance. So it's a really robust tool for designing concrete, uh, concrete overlays too. Now, this tool also features joint spacing as an input similar to the BCOAME, and that's really great as well because we can see the impact of going with shorter joint spacings or longer joint spacings. Additionally, it has failure mechanisms of roughness or IRI and faulting and cracking. So it kind of looks at all the ways that we would consider a concrete pavement to fail over time. 
Now the SJPCP module does not have all of those yet. It only has longitudinal cracking, which is one of the primary the primary way that we would see that type of um, concrete overlay to fail. So for more information, you can look at Pavement ME's website. It's a lot of good information there as well. Now I always like to kind of compare the two ASHO design methods, ASHO 93 and Pavement ME, because it really gives you an idea of just how robust the Pavement ME tool is and how um, how much information is in there and what you can really control to see the impact on the pavement design. So if we look at ASHO 93 versus Pavement ME, it really blew up the inference space of that older design tool with the new Pavement ME. See, with ASHO 93, we had limited uh, limited inference space where we had 1.1 million load repetitions of our trucks. Now we've got over 50 million load repetitions on some of those long-term uh, pavement performance sections. With, uh, the ASHO 90, with the ASHO road test, we had one set of materials local to Illinois. Now we've got pavement performance sections from all over the country with all the types of materials you could imagine. Um, additionally, we have climate information for 20 to 50 years, seeing how that's uh, influencing our pavement's performance. And we also have a wide variety of structural sections to really look at these, um, look at how these pavements perform. So looking at a little bit of a summary on these design tools, you can see here, uh, we've talked about a lot of this, but it's a good reference sheet for what we can actually do with these designs. You can see here, um, Ashton 93 and Pavement Designer do very similar things, um, just slightly different because Pavement Designer is a more mechanistic empirical approach. Ashton 93 is wholly empirical. You can see you can design for the same things, but those two design processes are really doing modifications to their respective jointed plane concrete pavement designs. BCOAME fully focused on bonded concrete overlays of asphalt. Pavement ME does just about everything. And then the failure criteria, again, these newer mechanistic empirical tools look more at cracking and faulting how pavements actually degrade over time as opposed to ASHNO 93, which is focused on um, present serviceability index. And then finally, you can see where climatic loading is influ or climatic loading is um, featured within the design process, where you can see joint spacing within the design process, as well as where you can use uh, design where you, which tools actually use fibers within the design process. Now, real quickly, I just want to show you guys the uh, few of these design tools that we've been talking about. So the first one is pavementdesigner.org. You can see here again, it's a free tool, so you can go in, you can start designing without having, um, without getting a license or anything like that. You can go in, you can start designing for concrete streets or parking lots or intermodal facilities. Within concrete streets, you'll see that we can design for overlays, full depth concrete pavements or new composite pavements. I've got an overlay design in here that I've already kind of done for us that will kind of show you what you need to do for a pavement designer overlay design. You can see here, we need a little information on our traffic, which is what we started off today talking about trucks per day, growth rate, directional and design lane distributions, some global inputs, percent slabs cracked and reliability. And then we can actually go in and determine what type of overlay we're designing for. For to note, unbonded overlay on asphalt, you can see we need a little information on our subgrade, little information on our concrete materials, and a little information on our structural layers. And then once we get all that information in, we can find our design summary where it will give us um, our design thickness, and we can actually analyze how that design thickness would change with some of those critical inputs that, uh, that we would put in our design. And that again gets into that idea of, hey, if I have an extra half of an inch of concrete, uh, half an inch of concrete, does that buy me an extra 10 years or so, or does it buy me just an extra two or three? And so that's really something to consider as we're going through the design process. So the next tool is the BCOA ME. Um, and this is, an, again, a free tool from the University of Pittsburgh under that FHWA pooled fund. You can see it's another, uh, with it being another free tool, if you just search BCOAME, you can get right to this uh, right to this site. And so they need a little information, a little more information than we needed with Pavement Designer. Um, you can see here we need where the project is, the elevation. It designs, uh, it designs its pavement based on easels or equivalent single axle loads, similar to ASHTO 93. See our failure criteria, maximum allowable percent slabs cracked, and the reliability needs a little climate information, which they've got some good uh, help screens on those as well. And then needs the existing structural layers. What's the asphalt? Uh, how much asphalt is there? What's the condition of it? 
and then we get into our concrete overlay properties as well as the um, joint design. What is our joint spacing? And then once we do that, you can calculate design and get your thickness of your concrete overlay. So the last tool that I will mention is uh, the last one that we talked about, which is Pavement ME. With Pavement ME, you can design for new pavements, overlays, as well as restoration. Within the overlays, you can see you can do all types of asphalt and concrete overlays. The one that um, I've already got a design run done for us is the SJPCP module. So if you've ever used Pavement ME, doing a concrete overlay is very similar to designing a new pavement. You've got, you've got all of the same inputs required. The only difference is you've got a couple extra inputs for that existing, um, that existing concrete section. The big benefit with Pavement ME is the output report is very robust in what it gives you. You can see each output report is usually somewhere between 13 and 15 or 20 pages. And you can see actually how the pavement distresses are degrading the pavement over time. So you can see that in this example here. Looks like I need a little extra concrete thickness for this design or to tweak some of my other design parameters. All right, so let's get back to the presentation uh, and finish up with some of our extra, uh, some of our final information before we hand it off to Angela. So the guide to concrete overlays has a little extra information, as I already mentioned, about some of the other design tools. Um, you can see they've got a few, uh, a few more charts that give a little more information than what we talked about here as well. And one thing that I would note in here is that um, this design information was actually developed uh, before Pavement Designer existed, uh, and Pavement Designer was previously called Street Pavement, so that's how it's in here. And then uh, this design chart was also developed before Pavement ME released its SJPCP, or Bonded Concrete Overlay on Asphalt module, so it doesn't feature that as well, but it does have a lot of good information um, in there. Now, some of the things that we've briefly touched on within these design tools but haven't quite got into is um, joint spacing and dowel and tie bar use within these uh, design processes. So joint spacing, we touched on a few of the design tools have it as an input or an output, um, but here it's good to remember that when we have those thinner uh, overlays, they tend to have shorter joint spacings. Again, shorter joint spacings control the stress within our concrete and that can help thin up that section. That's kind of the short version of how that go, uh, how that design process goes. So there's more information on that in the guide to concrete overlays as well. Now when it comes to dowel and tie bar use, this is one of the questions that we get fairly often, um, we tend to not use dowels within concrete overlays that are less than seven inches thick. Now if you're really adamant about using them, you may want to consider using plate dowels or something like, uh, or some alternate dowel geometry rather than conventional round dowels just if cover is a concern over and beneath those concrete uh, over and beneath those concrete towels. Now if we're doing unbonded overlays greater than five inches then we likely are going to use tie bars in all of our longitudinal joints. Um, if we're less than five inches it may not be appropriate to put in those tie bars. All right so some additional design consideration and features when we're doing these overlay designs, it's a good chance to kind of correct some things or possibly change some things about our existing pavement to um, make sure that it's uh, good to go for the next 10, 15, 20, or plus years. And so this is an option for uh, addressing our shoulders or doing a widening. It's also a chance to, and it provides a process for uh, looking at our vertical grade changes, whether we have overhead clearance for this uh, this concrete overlay, whether we need to adjust our barriers and our rails. Um, additionally, when we're adding thickness, we have to think about how that's sloped out to our shoulders and to our ditches. And we also have to think about our drainage structures and our transitions as well. So one option that we've seen used a fair amount is the idea of a safety edge. And the safety edge can help with our concrete overlays when we're adding structure yet still want to utilize our existing uh, section. So we may utilize this to kind of help as we're going with this new uh, concrete overlay. Now another thing that we need to think about in concrete overlay design is mixture design. And this is, this is one of those things that we have to design for that's not featured within those design software. It's something that's considered outside of those software um, that we've just talked about. So we have to uh, do our own mixture design. Now mixture design for concrete overlays is um, luckily is very similar slash exactly the same to concrete uh, full depth concrete pavement 
mixture design as well. So if you're in a state that's already utilizing performance engineered mixtures, great. That would be a great design process for doing these concrete overlay designs. So we want to use standard concrete paving mixtures whenever possible. Occasionally we do see accelerated mixtures used, but what we've seen a lot with PEM and uh, these concrete overlays is they gain strength fairly quickly. So you may not need an accelerated mixture to do concrete overlay and get it open to traffic fairly quickly, especially if you're using um, uh, maturity curves to um, determine when that concrete overlay can be opened as well. So there are a lot of tools for designing, uh, <coughs> designing that mixture. PEM is a great process. Those other tools like the tarantula curve, shield stone chart can also be used. Really what we're looking for is reducing that paste content to improve durability and shrinkage. And also one of the things that we consider more in concrete overlays than in others um, than in full depth concrete pavements is the inclusion of fibers. And if that's something that interests you, we could spend a lot more time talking about that, but there are good resources on that from the CP Tech Center. Um, you can find it in their resources as well. And they already have recorded webinars too. So great information is out there and available on that uh, on that inf on that topic. Excuse me. So the last couple things that we'll consider before we hand it off to Angela is um, the cons uh, consideration of the construction process and the design and um, creating construction documents. And so when we consider the construction process and design, part of that is how we're actually going to construct this pavement, but also part of it is concrete overlay quality control. Now, when we're doing these concrete overlays, a lot of times we're addressing some of the issues in the existing pavement. It's a good chance to kind of adjust some things with that existing structure and also consider some, possibly some adjustments to, um, to the surrounding area as well. But when we're doing concrete overlay design and thinking about quality control, what we need to think about is that existing, uh, that existing pavement. So a lot of times that profile needs some correction. Occasionally we'll do some of that with the concrete overlay. Occasionally we'll do some of that with milling. And, uh, but a lot of times it needs some correction. So we have that concrete overlay. It's important when, whenever we're doing this construction that we have to have that minimum thickness, that design thickness that we get from those pavement design software um, tools. We have to maintain that minimum thickness. So when we place this concrete overlay on our existing uh, pavement structure, we need to consider that when we're um, in the design process and thinking about design quantities as well. So here we need to think concrete is usually bid in square yards for placement, but we also should probably, uh, especially in these overlays, bid it in cubic yards for the, the actual material because we will likely have some overrun if we don't consider that. Additionally, if we have a profile that needs to be corrected, this is a great time to do that, whether it's by milling or some of it can possibly be done with the concrete overlay. And cross slope corrections is another thing that uh, should be considered too. So when we're thinking about these quantities, we again need to remember that we need to maintain that existing thickness. If we wanna do some milling in there, that's probably gonna help our situation as well. And then that contractor sets that, minimum, uh, that recommended design grade. But when we think about that, uh, kind of that quantity control, uh, you can see here when we're looking at those thinner concrete overlays, the adjustment factor is going to be fairly high because it's you know a half an inch of placement tolerance on that thin, thin section is a fairly significant portion of that section. And so you can see here what adjustment factors would be recommended for various thicknesses of concrete overlays. So with that, the last thing that I'll mention is uh, when we're putting together specifications, construction documents, there are a lot of great resources that are out there and that'll be talked about as well in the next, uh, the next overlay session. Um, but I just wanna mention two that are out there, the uh, development of concrete overlay construction documents and the guide specification for concrete overlays, some great tools out there that are free from the CP Tech Center. Really encourage you to look at them and use them um, if you're looking to, do, to design a concrete overlay. These things don't have to be overly complicated. They can be fairly simple and, con uh, and so designing and building these concrete overlays can be done and can be done well and easily. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And now we'll get to hear about some overlays that have actually been built. Uh, and Angela's gonna kind of take it away and show share the Colorado experience. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, that's a great transition. I will actually be uh, talking a little bit about the project that uh, that Eric highlighted in his um, last photo there. Um, you'll see that at the end of um, 
the end of my uh, slides, um, but I want to introduce you to um, concrete overlays, um, especially in Colorado with a little bit of a highlight, um, uh, what's happened in Wyoming also. And the work in um, Colorado really started um, kind of as, as an experiment. Um, and it started with uh, an industry uh, effort towards uh, just trying things out. Um, seeing what what could work and trying to find a solution uh, for uh, a, a distressed asphalt pavement and, and covering that up with a, a concrete overlay. So um, the first project that that really kind of kicked things off um, for the overlay program in Colorado was on Harmony Road near Fort Collins, Colorado in 1990. And this was a, an industry donated section um, and it had both uh, three and a half and five inch thick concrete overlay uh, areas. It was uh, really a very quick project, um, paved on a Saturday, um, and then opened back up to traffic uh, for the commute on Monday. And uh, so this was, you know, not a not a super heavy truck traffic area with just four percent truck traffic, uh, eighteen thousand vehicles per day. It's definitely, you know, increased over the years um, in in the last thirty years since it was built. Uh, but it was a great chance uh, to see what that kind of an overlay would do, how it would perform, how it would hold up to the traffic, and it taught us a lot. Uh, so this was the condition in 1995 when it was five years old, and then you can see again in, in 2006 at 16 years old, right before it was removed from service. Uh, so for uh, a, an overlay that was designed or, or anticipated, I guess not, not even really designed, but um, put out there for a two-year test um, to last 16 years old um, was, was very good performance overall. So uh, that kind of contributed to kicking off um, several different test sections. Uh, so the next one was built in 1994. And this one was actually a more formal test section instead of um, just the, you know, just the, the experimental look at things. Uh, and so this one led to um, just more organized research uh, and a more formal look at performance. So this is on Parker Road in Southeast Denver. Uh, there were four 200 foot test sections built. They were each five five inches thick, uh, but they had different joint spacing to, to look at what the impact of, of different joint spacing would be on performance. And uh, you'll see a couple different types of joint spacing um, throughout uh, the different projects that I, that I show you today. Uh, but you'll notice in the end, we really landed on that six by six joint spacing um, with a five to six inch overlay as, as being the best performer. So um, so while we wanted to look at, at some of the wider joint spacing, um, we've definitely seen in our state that uh, the narrow joint spacing has performed well. And, and that's something I just wanna point out as, as people look at, um, at projects all over the country that sometimes um, different joint spacings perform better in, in different places and different um, traffics, uh, traffic levels. So that's something to, to definitely look at at, at your specific project. Uh, but this um, project on Parker Road uh, had 1,500 ADT with 25% trucks. We had a little, uh, little higher percentage of trucks on this one. Uh, we looked at both milled and non-milled sections. And one important thing um, that happened on this was looking at tying the longitudinal joints. Um, but the, the longitudinal joints were only tied along the lane lines. Uh, so we learned a little bit from that also. Uh, and in Colorado, uh, our experience with, with tying uh, joints has, has shifted to tying all of our longitudinal joints. And that's something that varies across the country also. So the, the next uh, test section uh, a couple years later was on State Highway 119 near Longmont, Colorado. Uh, and this was uh, 20,000 ADT section um, with 8% trucks. And this one had several different thicknesses, uh, six inches in the truck lane, uh, and then four and a half inches, both in the passing lane and the shoulder. Uh, and we're able to achieve some of those different thicknesses through milling, as you can see in the photo. Uh, and you can also see that, that tie bars were used in, in this project also. Um, and this, Project in Longmont, um, you can see, has performed uh, very well. It's actually now out of service um, due to a reconstruction project in the area. 
Uh, it's unfortunate that it was taken out of service because it was still performing well. Uh, you can see the condition in 2009 uh, when it was 13 years old and it went all the way to 20 years uh, and still had a lot of life left in it, but because of a lot of changes in the area and growth and, and the need for reconstruction um, of a big section of, of 119, uh, it was taken out of service, but it did have a lot of research done on it over those 20 years, and so that really benefited uh, the direction of uh, concrete overlay design in Colorado. So here's a little bit different application as we look at some, some pretty heavy truck traffic. Uh, this is US 287 near Campo, Colorado, which is way in the southeast corner, um, really close to the Oklahoma border. Uh, this was a six inch concrete overlay uh, that was surrounded by uh, some, some thicker overlaid areas. And so that's why it's called the Lone Mile. It was kind of out there by itself with that um, one mile of a six inch overlay. It had six by six uh, joint spacing uh, and you can see 60% trucks. This is a, a really heavy truck route uh, from Oklahoma all the way um, through Colorado uh, as part of the Ports to Plains route. So it does, um, does get a lot of heavy truck traffic. Uh, unfortunately, this test section was also removed uh, due to reconstruction in the area and not due to distress by any means, but, um, but another uh, reconstruction project uh, nearby and, and the desire to not have that lone mile sitting out there um, all by itself and, and needing to be rehabbed later uh, with being a little bit difficult to access. So great performance out of this one and um, it continues to um, it continue to teach us a lot throughout its life. So moving on to uh, 1997, um, this is a project up in Northeast Colorado. And you'll see, um, as I show some of these different projects, we'll, we'll talk about what the performance looks like uh, currently. And you'll notice in, in all these little uh, clips uh, with the drivability condition, the green indicates high, moderate is low, or excuse me, uh, blue is moderate and red is low. And one thing that we've noticed with uh, most of these overlays is that they really stay in that high drivability condition uh, for quite a while. Uh, so there are two, two projects highlighted on this slide. One is uh, from east of Fleming to Haxton, uh, and it was a five and a half inch or, uh, overlay. Um, actually, it's closer to 5.9 inch. You'll see on the, the photo on the next slide. Uh, and because it was a metric project, uh, we did, did a few years of metric in there. Uh, but at, um, in 2019, it had 12 years of remaining drivability life. Uh, so it, we'd expect this to last you know, quite a bit longer than, uh, than the 20 years it was designed for. So it's already exceeded its design life and has another 12 years um, remaining drivability life anticipated. And we could see it going quite a bit longer than that too. So then in 2001, uh, from Haxton to Holyoke, uh, just a little bit east of the, the first project, there was an eight inch concrete overlay built. And that one also is, is performing quite well. Uh, and you can see the, the high drivability life remaining on that also. So um, both, both the, you know, the six inch, the slightly thinner section, and then the eight inch all um, perform quite well on these, these heavy truck routes. So we're gonna move back to a little bit more on the urban side. Uh, this is uh, State Highway 121, Wadsworth Boulevard in the Southwest part of Denver uh, in the metro area. And this was a six inch overlay that was built in 2001, uh, three and a half miles long. And this has a little heavier truck or heavier uh, just commuter traffic um, than you've seen in some of the other examples. But it has also um, performed quite well. And I just drove it um, pretty recently and it looks great. Uh, it does have uh, four inch test sections with four by four foot joint spacing. Uh, and this was um, to, to add more um, to the research project and, and the development of a design equation uh, for Colorado to use for concrete overlays. So this was instrumented uh, and was monitored for a number of years. And so we've got several different, different test sections. Uh, the other one was four and a half inches with six by six uh, foot joint spacing. So had these kind of mixed in with the overall 
uh, six by six uh, project with the the six inch overlay that that kind of took over the rest of uh, the rest of the project. So uh, coming out of this, um, we we did learn a lot, and I'll talk a little bit about the research um, in a in a um, future slide here. But I want to point out the the condition now uh, in 2019. It was high drivability life. 12 years uh, remaining is what they anticipate, but this is another one where we can see this um, going well beyond uh, the anticipated remaining drivability life um, based on the performance we've seen to date. So to give a little snapshot of some of the research that's been done, uh, this was a report that was published in 2004 uh, that used several of those earlier uh, test sections that I mentioned. and uh, helped CDOT to develop their um, thin white topping procedure. So this is a um, spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet uh, that's used by the DOT and they uh, incorporate uh, a number of the different properties uh, that uh, Eric mentioned in, you know, in his review of the different design processes. Uh, this is one that just customized a little bit more to the performance in Colorado. So I'm going to jump over to the western side of the state now and look at an interstate project. Uh, this is on I-70 west of Grand Junction. It's uh, over close to the Utah border and it was a, a little over a four mile section. It had a 20 year design life uh, and the, the asphalt surface was milled prior to the placement of the six inch concrete overlay. This was built in 2012 so it's now eight years old. Uh, and it is performing extremely well. Uh, and for some reason, this 12 years of uh, remaining drivability life is kind of a popular number uh, that we see on a lot of these um, concrete overlays. And, and often that 12 years will see that pop up um, year after year. So it kind of keeps extending the projected um, remaining drivability life for, for a lot of these projects. So uh, as this one, um, continues to um, continues to age, we would anticipate that it will still uh, have quite a bit of, of drivability life left uh, to carry the traffic over on, on the western side of the state. All right, we're going to cross the border uh, north up into Wyoming. So this is US 30 near Cokeville, Wyoming, and this was um, Wyoming DOT's first uh, real endeavor into uh, concrete overlays uh, on a, a large scale. Uh, this was a six inch thick uh, overlay on a, you know, a state highway with, or a, excuse me, a US highway with a pretty heavy truck uh, count, uh, six inch thick, six by six joint spacing, so kind of that standard uh, that we found to really perform well. Uh, and you can see on the, the right side of the screen uh, how they were able to just split the, the shoulders, the eight foot shoulders into four by six panels. So that worked well. And that project was constructed under traffic uh, using a pilot car. And you can see the, the heavy truck traffic in the photo here. Uh, and then also on the right side of the, the slide, you can see um, the performance uh, more recently and it, this is has performed really well we don't have drivability life numbers on this but uh but we're seeing visually uh it's it's performed quite well and we anticipate um this project to to be in service for for a lot longer and, and carry uh keep carrying those trucks for a long time okay so tying back into um the slide that eric showed earlier uh state highway 13 north of craig this is a, a more recent project um in colorado uh that basically carries um traffic from colorado uh up into wyoming and from wyoming down into colorado um to access some of the, the mountain region there uh, but this was a six inch overlay that was placed in 2015 uh, in an area that doesn't have a lot of concrete. So there was a little bit of uh, nervousness in, in the area about having uh, that concrete road and, and maintaining it, but they love it up there. Um, and they found the, the plowing to be really, uh, really a simple process for them. Uh, they love the smoothness of it. So it, it was a a really um, great addition to that part of the state to have that have that overlay there. 
A uh, couple things I'd like to point out about this one um, are that it was an alternate bid project and concrete pavement was actually first cost low. Uh, so that you know shows the the potential for um, these concrete overlays to be extremely competitive um, while providing a long-term uh, great solution uh, to perform under traffic. So this one, as I mentioned, six inch concrete overlay with six by six joint spacing, six miles long, uh, 20 year design. And as we've seen with a lot of these six by six by six projects, we anticipate them to, to you know, extremely exceed those, uh, those 20 year designs. So I'm throwing one last uh, project in here that's just a little bit different, uh, a parking lot project, but because of the size of it, uh, I wanted to, to include this one also. Uh, this was originally supposed to be uh, over 300,000 square yards, but because of the recent cuts in, um, in air, air traffic uh, and not, not a lot of revenues coming in for parking lots like this, uh, this the, other half of the project was canceled, but um, we do have a, a pretty impressive uh, parking lot overlay, four and a half to five inch. Uh, it has six by six joint spacing and nearly 150,000 square yards was built uh, last year. Uh, and it will start um, start carrying a lot of traffic uh, and a whole lot of those cars as, as traffic comes back to the airports. All right, so um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the corridor uh, strategy uh, that, co that Colorado has used and, and some of these projects tie back to some of the experiments that I um, and the, the test projects that I talked about earlier. So the Parker Road corridor in southeast Denver uh, carries a lot of commuter traffic. Uh, most of the overlays along this stretch are about five to six inches thick and use that that six by six joint spacing that we found to be successful uh, in addition to having the longitudinal joints tied. The 287 corridor in southeast Colorado, that one I, I highlighted the six inch uh, overlay test section, but there's a, a long stretch um, of more full depth overlays that nine to 12 inch range that, um, that the, the DOT decided would be a good uh, solution for uh, a longer term design uh, and doing, doing that full depth overlay with the, the more traditional 12 by 15 foot joint spacing. So there's over 150 miles of overlay on this section. We're anticipating another um, couple miles to be built this year uh, and we're seeing very good performance uh, in that area. So you can see this, this whole stretch um, of the, the high drivability life. And some of those projects are, uh, you can see 20 years old and, and some are even older than that at this point. So, uh, so we're definitely seeing those, those really, uh, the really good performance that we wanna see uh, out of these overlays and expect uh, them to perform for a number of years into the future. So one question to uh, wrap up the conversation, where can concrete overlays be built? And I hope that I've shown uh, a, a wide range of that uh, throughout all of these examples. Uh, divided highways, urban arterials, uh, rural two-lane highways, interstates, parking lots, um, and all different types of applications, whether it's farm to market, uh, heavy truck or commuter, uh, and also in industrial areas. So basically anywhere you need a, a durable surface to make your infrastructure investment go further, that's where we want to look at, at concrete, concrete overlays as a solution. And finally, what have we learned uh, in Colorado? Uh, I've mentioned the tying longitudinal joints a number of times. Uh, we, we saw joint separation where we didn't tie longitudinal joints. So that's, uh, that was a lesson learned for us. Uh, milling is definitely beneficial, especially when we look at controlling uh, quantities. And Eric mentioned uh, the potential for having a separate bid item for concrete um, by the cubic yard. Uh, and that's one approach. Uh, another way that, that concrete or that contractors um, can control those quantities is by, by milling and having uh, a better idea of, of, of that bottom surface um, being a little more consistent. 
Uh, material selection is important, and Eric covered that too. Uh, so having good quality concrete is just as important with an overlay as it is with a traditional concrete pavement. Uh, we've learned that we're seeing lower annual maintenance costs um, based on studies by CDOT. And uh, we're also seeing um, performance over the, over the life, the, the smoothness um, really being uh, maintained over a longer period uh, with that shorter joint spacing. So uh, just a, kind of one of those things that we've seen as we review uh, condition studies over time. And we've also learned that concrete overlays can definitely uh, save time during construction. Uh, when that, that um, platform um, to pave on is already there, uh, it's not impacted by uh, rainstorms, uh, things like that, that, that can impact when we're doing uh, more of a traditional reconstruction project. So uh, it's definitely more efficient uh, in a lot of cases. So I hope I've um, provided a good overview of, of some of the ways that we've used concrete overlays in Colorado. And uh, thank you for your time today. Wonderful. I really want to thank both Eric and Angela for uh, very useful and information, uh, uh, useful information. And uh, we look forward to seeing all of you at our next webinar. For those of you who want to pick up the recordings of the other four of the five sessions, feel free to go to the CP Tech website and uh, you can watch them there. And with that, we'll th thank everyone and shut this down.